Well, people are still joining. Uh, hello, everyone. Nice to see you again. Today we have the sixth talk in the colloquium series for this year. And first, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australian land and pay my respect to the elders, past and present. At Monash, the Bunurong people. Today, I am happy to present Peter Abamonte, who is a Fox family professor of engineering at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. He is one of the leaders in the physics of strongly correlated electrons in different materials, including high temperature superconductors, heavy fermion system, excitonic insulators, and many others. Peter has received his PhD in 1999 at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and after postdoctoral positions at University of Groningen in the Netherlands and at the Cornell University, he joined Brookhaven National Lab as a researcher. And in 2005, he has returned to his alma mater as a faculty. Okay, Peter, the stage is yours and we will enjoy the talk. Okay, good. Well, uh, thanks Dimitri and everyone for the invitation and for coming. Uh, it's good timing. We just had a paper come out on this topic, so it's uh, great for me to have the opportunity to, to uh, well, not visit, but uh, at least have the chance to explain to all of you about our work. Um, so to jump right to the point, uh, we have discovered a new particle. And let me see if I can get the pointer working. Just a second. Okay, can you see this thing? Yep. Okay, so um, we discovered a new particle and it's called a demon. And um, this is an excitation in a solid that was predicted in the 1950s by a theorist named David Pines. And it's closely related to another excitation you may have heard of called a plasmon. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna explain to you what this is, why it was predicted, why it's important, and why it took 67 years for us to find it. And now that we've seen it, um, what uh, it might be useful for and what to do in the future. So this is gonna, um, so this describes the PhD research of my former student, Ali Hussein, who now works for a quantum computing company in Colorado, and a theorist um, named Edwin Huang, who is now at Notre Dame. Um, so I'll just uh, dive in here. So what I'm going to do is um, back up a little bit and first explain what is a plasmon. So there's a similar collective mode that's much more common. Most people think of this as being a thing in metals. And um, there's a nice explanation of this in Ashcroft and Merman, which is a textbook on solid state physics. And I'll just recycle their argument. So let's suppose I have a block of a metal. So metal is a thing in which you have electrons and the electrons can freely move. And then I take, somehow I take the electrons and I displace them all to the right in this picture. So what will happen, but I keep the ions in the solid fixed. So what will happen is I'll build up a surface negative charge on one boundary of the material, and then a surface positive charge on the other boundary. And what that'll do is it'll create an electric field inside the medium. So it's a little bit like a capacitor. And um, the consequence of that is there will be a return force. So there will be an, there will be an E field exerting a force on the electrons in the solid. And the size of the return force will be proportional to the size of the displacement. And if you learned about Hooke's law, you know if I have an object with mass, with inertia, and there's a force that's proportional to distance, I have a harmonic oscillator. And you can just sit down and write out the resonance frequency of this oscillator. That's called the plasma frequency, and it's just N e squared over epsilon naught m. Uh, N's the density of electrons, E is the electron charge, m is the mass. And this is called the plasma frequency. And every metal has uh, has a plasma frequency in copper and aluminum. It's in the sort of 15 to 20 electron volts range. And this is the fundamental collective mode in a metal. And it seems rather simple. It's actually the thing that makes metals reflective. But um, what a plasmon is, is it's really a sound wave in the electron density. It's, it's like an acoustic phonon, but in the electrons themselves instead of the nuclei. And um, the fact that electrons are charged actually makes this 
phonon-like excitation sit up at very high frequency. And it's a real particle in the sense um, it, it's actually an example of a boson. It can carry energy, it can carry entropy. Um, so it's a real sort of uh, emergent uh, particle of collective mode of the system. So now um, plasmons have many real world consequences. One of them is that all metals are reflective below the plasma frequency. So if you get up and you look in the mirror in the morning, then the reason it's reflecting is because it, you excite virtual plasmons when you shine light on it. Um, there's another quantity that I'm gonna discuss in a few minutes called the dynamic charge susceptibility, which is related to the dielectric function. And the experimental signature of a plasmon is clearest in this uh, susceptibility, which I'm gonna call chi. So if you measure the imaginary part of this thing at some fixed momentum as a function of energy, then what you'll see is a peak in the plasma frequency with a width that's given by the lifetime. So this is sort of the most direct way to show that a plasmon is present in a metal. The reason I bring this up is because you can measure this quantity by scattering electrons off a of metal, which is how plasmons were originally discovered and is also how we found the demon. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, okay, so good. So what's a demon? So in a paper in 1956, I'm willing to bet almost nobody on this Zoom call was born in 1956. Maybe it's possible, but um, David Pines, who's a theorist, asked the following question. He said, let's suppose I have a metal that has two different kinds of electrons in it. And um, so if there's anybody in the room who knows about condensed matter physics, you know metals can have more than one Fermi surface in them. So this would be, say, if I just have two different bands crossing the Fermi energy, and he imagined that these two different kinds of electrons had different masses. And for the sake of PowerPoint, I'm gonna assume that half the, the red ones are actually holes. So we're gonna assume we have some light electrons that are, or sorry, we have some heavy electrons that are blue and some light holes that are red. It actually doesn't matter if they're both electrons, um, but I'm gonna assume they're holes because it's, e it's easier to show it in what happens in PowerPoint. At any rate, so let's suppose you have this system and then you ask, what is the plasmon of this system? So this is what he considered in this early paper. And basically what he, um, the way he framed the problem is he said, okay, if I took away the red particles and I only had the blue ones, that would have a plasmon. If I took away the blue ones and I only had the red ones, that would have another plasmon. So if I have both, I should have two plasmons, one from each batch, though the two may interact with one another. And then he went through some um, mathematics and arguing. And what he concluded is that you would indeed have two plasmons. And the first one would be sort of at the quadrature sum of the frequencies of the individual plasmons. So omega p being from the heavy particles and little omega p, p being from the light ones. And that would be sort of a conventional plasmon where all the charge just moves together in sync. But what he argued was that there would be a second plasmon that would be gapless. Now, what does gapless mean? Gapless means that this thing isn't sitting up at some high frequency. Its frequency is actually proportional to its momentum, the proportionality constant being some kind of velocity. And that velocity would be similar to the Fermi velocity of the electrons in the two bands. And this is a very strange prediction. It's very hard to make a plasmon-like excitation that's at low, that's gapless. And the reason, if you come back to this basic plasmon argument, is if I try to move charge, it always costs this Coulomb energy. This is why plasmons sit at high frequency in metals. So it's a very odd thing to make a prediction that there would be a plasmon like excitation that is. That's Peter, may, ask, may I interrupt and ask a question? Absolutely, yes. Are you saying that if I have a normal metal with one kind of electron, say protons and electrons, then yeah. I have a plasma and I have a normal sound? And normal sound is a, a demon, whatever, how you call it? Whatever. Yes. yes. Normal the sound the... in a solid is a demon. Yes. This plain old sound is the demon of a normal solid, where okay. the demon came from the ions and the electrons. Correct. So what this is basically saying is there's an actual, and that we call a phonon, okay? So what this, what Pines predicted is there can be a purely electronic phonon where one set of electrons acts like the nuclei for the other set of electrons. Yes, of course, of course. It's a strange idea, but there's no reason it shouldn't happen. 
Yes, of course it must. It's and, really... um, I'm glad it's obvious to you because many people don't <laughs> sort of don't buy it. Um, okay, so I made a cartoon to show how this could happen. So uh, let's suppose that the positively charged electrons, the holes are very light, and then the blue ones, the negatively charged ones, are very heavy. So that means that the light ones will move very fast compared to the heavy ones. So if I just let the system go, what's going to happen is these red ones will move in such a way as to screen the Coulomb interaction between the, the heavy ones. And when I'm done, so once this screening has taken place, I can really think of the system as being a set of neutral particles where the positive charges have completely neutralized the energy, the uh, charge of the negative charges. And so if I go back, and so this object, which is not a bound state, you should really think of it more of as a screening effect, but this object is neutral. So if I look at low energy, I can think of the system as in a sense being a collective mode, having a collective mode of particles where the particles are neutral, being not either electrons or holes, but electrons screened by the other, by the hole carriers, in which case the plasma frequency is zero. So there's several ways to think about it. You can think of it as the electrons and holes all moving together so that the thing remains um, overall neutral, or you can think of it as like a collective mode of particles where the charge has somehow been neutralized. At any rate, it's a new kind of mode. I mean, it's a different thing from a plasmon. It's still made of electrons, and it should exist in a lot of different materials. I mean, not every material is guaranteed to have a demon, but there's no reason it shouldn't be common. So if you get to the end of his paper, which is not light reading, he actually names this excitation, and I'm just going to read it. Because I'll be honest, I don't really like the name demon. <laughs> I wouldn't have named it that myself. Um, but here's what he says. He says, I always thought it too bad that Maxwell lived too early to have a particle or excitation named in his honor. Therefore, I suggest that in honor of Maxwell, and because we deal here with the case of distinct electron motion, or DEM, we call these new excitations demons. Or maybe he meant it to be pronounced demons. I don't know. Um, David Pines died in 2018, the same year that we first saw this in the lab, and we didn't know what it was at the time. It took several years to figure it out. So I can't go to him and ask him what's the pronunciation. Also, I can't go to him and say, I think we should call it something else. <laughs> Once you die, you know, your papers become like scripture. So you sort of just have to respect the, uh, the person and go with what they said. So, okay, so that's the backstory. Um, <clears throat> if you ask, why do demons matter? The reason is because if you go back in time, there were a lot of predictions, in particular this one from Marvin Cohen, that demons should actually mediate superconductivity. So as you know, phonons and real solids are what cause superconductivity to exist. And um, the thing that makes phonons due to that is the fact that they're at low energy, so they can mediate interactions between particles at the Fermi surface. So there were a lot of papers early on, so this is 1981, um, discussing whether demons could be the origin of superconductivity in a lot of different kinds of metals. So if these things were shown to exist, it might be the explanation for um, superconductivity in a lot of things. So there was a lot of interest in demons theoretically in the 1960s and 1970s, but nobody ever saw one. So the subject just kind of fizzled out and people stopped working on it. And then it, then high temperature superconductivity was discovered and then carbon nanotubes and graphene and the high TC and iron arsenides and twisted van der Waals materials and topology and its ancient history. Everyone forgot this subject ever existed. At least I did. Um, okay, so um, I was told there might be some experts in the audience, so I'm going to take two slides and just do something for the experts. If you want to tune out right now, it's fine. I'll remind you when it's time to come back. But I want to bring up, raise a, some a few points about what are the experimental signatures of a demon. Um, one of them, of course, is that a demon is massless or gapless, if you like. So a conventional plasmon sits at high frequency. Demon, if you were to measure its dispersion curve, should go to zero as Q goes to zero. So that's one experimental signature. But other kinds of excitations are gapless. So if you saw a gapless excitation, 
you'd want to do more than just see that. You'd need to have some secondary check on whether it was really a demon or not. So it's worth asking, is there an experimental signature of the fact that this thing is neutral? And this is a little bit technical, but I'll go through it and hopefully it'll make some sense. Okay, so how could you tell if a demon is neutral? And let's suppose we have a way of measuring this thing I call the dynamic charge susceptibility, which we do, you can measure it with electron scattering. So let's just suppose that that thing's measurable. So how, so what would you expect to happen? So let's suppose I had a regular metal. So let me just take a five minutes or three minutes and talk about screening in metals for a second. So let's suppose I just took a piece of metal. This be, could be copper or aluminum or doped silicon or any conductor. And I put it in between two plates. Okay, so I make a capacitor. And then what I do is I charge up these plates. So I put a voltage on them, which means I put some free charge. So I put positive sigma on one plate and negative sigma on the other one. And then I ask what happens to the metal that's stuck in between. So as you may be aware, metals are things that screen perfectly, which means the electric field is always zero inside a metal. So what that means is that the metal will actually build up surface charges that counteract the charges of the plates. So it will acquire a minus sigma on this face and a plus sigma on this face. Those are bound charges now, so that the E field inside is zero. So the consequence of that is that the dielectric constant of a, of a, a metal at zero frequency is actually infinite. So the E field in a dielectric would be E naught divided by epsilon. It would be reduced by a factor of epsilon. In a conductor, epsilon basically diverges. This is sort of the definition of a conductor. So the consequence of that is that, um, okay, so epsilon, the dielectric function, is actually related to the dynamic charge susceptibility. So epsilon, it turns out, is one over one plus V chi. V is just the Coulomb interaction. Coulomb interaction is E squared over R. If I Fourier transform that, it's E squared over Q squared, okay? So, um, so this chart, dynamic charge susceptibility tells you basically how the material screens in a different way. And the susceptibility satisfies two sum rules, okay? So sum rules are very important in physics and they're very important in optics. And the first one is called the Friedel sum rule. And it says basically if I take the real part of the dynamic susceptibility at zero frequency as a function of Q and I multiply by the Coulomb interaction in the long wavelength limit, that is Q goes to zero, this goes to minus one. This is true in all metals. And it basically says that if I put a point charge in a metal, it's uh, the um, induced charge will be equal and opposite to the charge that I put in saying that, so metals will completely screen off any kind of free charge that is inserted into them. So that's the Friedel sum rule. That's another way of defining a metal. The other sum rule this thing satisfies is called the F sum rule. And it says that if I take the first moment of this chi function as a fun integrated over frequency, so I take the imaginary part, I multiply by omega and, and I integrate, it goes to a constant. And the constant is just determined by the total number of electrons and, and there's a factor of Q squared that actually also comes from the Coulomb interaction. So this thing has a universal value that's limited by the number of particles in the system. And these two things work together. So the real part goes like Q squared at small Q. The imaginary part goes like Q squared at small Q. And they all conspire to satisfy these two sum rules. And you can measure all these things by measuring chi double prime. So if you take a metal and you measure chi double prime from it, you'll see a plasmon. As you go to Q equals zero, and I've done this many times in my life, you can just watch the intensity of the thing vanish as uh, Q squared. So um, all this stuff works. I'm not a field theorist. I'm a little bit of a mechanic when it comes to some rules and things, but I can tell you that this stuff works. Okay, so this is a normal metal. So the point I wanna make is um, in a demon, things are a little bit different. So let's suppose I had a demon material and it didn't have a conventional plasmon. It only had a demon, okay? So it, in other words, it's a conductor, but, um, it's a conductor where all the free charges are, are fully screened. So they're all basically electrically neutral. And then I take that thing and I put it inside a capacitor in the same way I did my metal and I ask what happens. Okay, so I take my block of demon material and I stick it in here and then I put on some free charge like I did for the metal and I ask what occurs? The answer is nothing. And the reason is that I cannot, if I come back to this picture, I'm gonna just, 
do bad talking. If and I imagine, you know, my demon is made of these neutral particles. Neutral particles cannot screen. Okay, so the system wouldn't have any way to respond to the E field that it had been placed in. So it will not be able to build up any surface charge on the boundary. Said another way, if I had a metal and the only excitation in it was a demon, its dielectric constant would be one. It would just be like vacuum. Now in a real demon material, of course, this isn't true because there will also be that other plasmon sitting up at high frequency. But if you're just looking at the demon sector itself, it can't, it can't uh, contribute to the dielectric constant in the long wavelength limit. So the consequence of that is if you look, if you go back to this uh, sum rule here and ask what does that mean for the charge susceptibility, if this thing has to go to one in the long wavelength limit and V goes like one over Q squared, chi has to do something like this, which, is, which means that in the long wavelength limit, chi can't go like Q squared it has to go something faster than Q squared. It has to go to Q to the two plus alpha where alpha is something bigger than zero because V goes like one over Q squared. So for this thing to go to one, chi has to go to zero faster than that. There's a question in the chat. Look at this. It, and yes, it, yes, Peter, yes, there is a question. Maybe Matt, would you like to ask? Yeah, can demons be polarized? That is a great question. I, and it, it's actually related. You could ask the same question about plasmons. Are, are, can plasmons be polarized? I'm, let me answer this at the end because there's actually, this actually touches on an important concept that I only learned about in the re recent years, which is that wow. um, plasmons actually were the inspiration for the Higgs mechanism that. Wow. Peter, now we know explains all mass in the universe. Uh, I Peter, might answer this at the end. Yeah, Dimitri. Could Dimitri. I also interrupt you? So, the, am I understood correctly that this neutral picture is based uh, on the initial assumption that you have electrons and holes, but demons it's, looks to be more generic and exist when you have two kinds of electrons. To electronic uh, yes. species. Yes. And in absolutely. this case, they're not neutral. Yes. Well, uh, no, actually, what happens? Yeah, good. So, all right. So now I got two questions and I got to decide what order to answer this. So, the one about can demons be polarized? <clears throat> you can have both longitudinal plasmons and transverse plasmons. The thing that we call a plasmon normally is the longitudinal one. The transverse modes are there, but you normally think of them as just being the photon. With a different polarization or, or you know with a different phase velocity because the thing is traveling in a metal the same is true of demons okay you can have a longitudinal demon and there can be transverse demons as well um, all the transverse modes whether they're plasmon modes or demon modes are gapless and they're really sort of renormalizations of the photon <clears throat> so it's a good question and it that actually is related to the higgs mechanism which maybe i'll discuss at the end okay dimitri your question was Yes, it doesn't matter. You don't need electrons and holes. So let me just, I'm going to use my hands for a second. Can everybody see me? Yeah, sure. So if I have electron, if I have electrons and holes, the demon mode corresponds to the one where they all move together. And the plasmon would be the one where they all move opposite. If I have two baths of electrons, you know, negatively charged electrons can screen negative charge. That's perfectly possible. So in, if I have two electron bands where everything's negatively charged, the conventional plasmons where they all move together and the demons where they all move opposite. Okay. okay. So it doesn't matter if one bath is hole-like and the other one is electron-like or they're both electrons or they're both holes. You can always have a demon. All right. Now I've totally messed up my screen, but I'm going to try again. Does this work? Am I back? Yeah, perfectly. Okay. Anyway, here's the point. If you measure the intensity of a plasmon as a function of Q, it goes like Q squared. If you measure the intensity of a demon as a function of Q, it has to go faster than Q squared. I don't know what the power law will be in any given measurement, but it'll be bigger than two. This is important because if you see an excitation, it's gapless. It doesn't prove it's a demon. You have to also show that it's neutral. And we spent quite a long time on this. So it's a, it's a technical point. If you believe me, 
Anyway, you can ignore this. <laughs> but if you don't believe me, then this is for you. Um, okay, so. Um, Peter, also... I'm sorry. I, I don't believe because Good. I think that any chest excitation, uh, this is Higgs. Uh, yeah. Higgs, any chest excitation must be gapped. Any any uh, non charged uh, uh, gallstone, this you are talking about gallstone like excitation, must be gapless. Yeah. Um, well, I think this, the answer to that is this is a neutral excitation. It's a collective mode of neutral particles. This is what and I'm saying. As soon as it is neutral, it must be gapless. Yeah, that's right. In the long wavelength limit. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so uh, so it's a neutral mode, but it's still made out of charged particles. They just yes. move in such a way as to maintain neutrality. And that's strictly only true in, at, law, at, at Q equals zero. At finite Q, then it might have some energy. So there's a dispersion curve, which I'm going to show you in a few minutes. Yes, and this is what I said. It's like sound. It's, because yeah, in sound, it's protons are moving together with electrons. Yeah, this is electronic sound. Okay, it's electronic sound, correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So yeah. So actually, and here this is an important point. Um, demons can't contribute to epsilon in the long wavelength limit, and the consequence of that is demons don't couple to light. And I think this is the reason why they haven't been seen. So they were predicted in the fifties, but nobody saw them experimentally because, look, most measurements we have of the particle hole excitations in metals met materials have something to do with probing them with photons. And uh, you can't couple to a demon with a photon, at least in the long wavelength limit. You could probably do it with x-rays. You could probably do it with some kind of near field spectroscopy technique that violates dipole selection rules and things. Um, but it's not something you would stumble on in routine measurements of materials. So that's why they haven't been seen. OK, and uh, let's see. Yeah, so let's suppose I had a demon with linear dispersion. And then I insisted that it follow this kind of uh, functional form in the real part, the real part and the imaginary part being related by Kramer's Kronig. It implies that the intensity of the demon would have to go like Q to the three plus alpha, where alpha is some number greater than zero. So it's just a secondary check. <clears throat> okay, so that's the technical part. Um, uh, that's the signature of neutrality. Also, it would have to be neutral to be gapless. So if you see something gapless and elect it's electronic, it's got to be neutral. Anyway, all this stuff needs to work for it to really be believable, in my opinion. Okay, so um, <clears throat> we did not go out in search of demons. We were simply doing electron scattering experiments on materials because we knew that it's important to measure charge excitations at non-zero Q. We saw this mode in 2018 by accident. And it took several years to figure out what it was. So I'm not going to pretend like we did this on purpose. It was completely serendipitous. Um, so with that said, the material of interest is called strontium ruthenate. So this is a perovskite. It's basically a stack of ruthenium oxide layers separated by some strontium atoms. It has the same crystal structure as some of the high temperature superconductors, but it's actually low temperature superconductor. TC is about one and a half Kelvin. And um, <clears throat> what's intriguing about strontium ruthenate, well, is two things. The first is that it's actually a very nice Fermi liquid. So um, it has really long-lived quasi-particles near the Fermi energy. And if you measure the resistivity as a function of temperature, it has a nice T-squared form. So it's very well-behaved, has nice, um, well-defined oscillations in shubnikov de Haas experiments. So um, it's really just straight out of the textbooks. Um, if you do photomission, it has three different bands. So they derive from the three uh, D levels of the ruthenium. And, um, and it, the consequence is it has three different, uh, yeah, so there's three different Fermi surfaces. So, so this material has three different flavors of electrons. It's not just two, it's actually three. And so you, I guess you could say it's a candidate demon material. It's not proven that it could have a, should have a demon, but it's certainly possible that it could. Um, one of the interesting things about strontium ruthenate in particular is if you look at these beta and gamma bands, uh, the vo uh, velocities and effective masses differ by about a factor of two. So they're not really heavy and really light, but they are different from one another. So you might 
wonder if it had a demon, though, of course, you'd have to do an experiment and a calculation to get both to, to be sure. Okay, so here's the experiment. <clears throat> so um, we've been calling this MEALS. It's basically momentum resolved electron energy loss spectroscopy, which is a fancy word for inelastic electron scattering. I could go through the math, but what's way better is a movie. So let's suppose I take a material and I cleave it, and then I take an electron, I shoot it at the surface, and then it'll scatter from the surface, make a collective mode. And then the idea is, and a collective mode could be a plasmon, it could be a phonon, it could be an exciton, it could be anything, Just, but it has to be something that modulates the density. And um, the idea here is then I know the, I specify the incident energy and momentum of the le electron, and then I measure the energy and momentum of the scattered electron. And the, I measure then if I see a peak with a certain energy transfer and momentum transfer, I know there has to be a particle there. So this is based on an old technique called HR eels, um, which maybe some of you have heard of. It's kind of gone out of use, popular use. Um, so what we did is we uh, basically made this momentum resolved with uh, really high accuracy. So the energy resolution here is uh, 6 MeV is in the measurements that I'm going to show you. It has a sphere of confusion of 80 microns. If you don't know what that is, it's fine. What it means is that we can measure the momenta both with high resolution and high accuracy, high accuracy and high precision. Resolution means you measure, you integrate over a very small volume of momentum space. Um, accuracy means I know exactly where I put that volume in momentum space so I can tell where I am. Uh, the differential scattering cross-section is some matrix elements times S of Q and omega. This is the density-density response function of the surface. So basically, what EELS measures is density fluctuations on the surface of a material. And S satisfies uh, what is called the fluctuation dissipation theorem. So this spectrum of fluctuations is proportional to the imaginary part of the um, Green's function. And that's basically the dynamic charge susceptibility that I showed you earlier, with one difference that it's actually the susceptibility of the surface. And that's an important distinction that's discussed in these papers. Um, it, I'm, going to gloss over that a little bit because it's not going to be that important for what we see, except at the end when we do the sum rule. At any rate, um, this is sort of, a, this is the dissipative part of a Green's function. This is the spectrum of fluctuations. The relationship between those is a fluctuation dissipation theorem. The point I want to make is um, this is a lot like angle resolve photomissions. So if any of you know about ARPES, the photomission intensity is some matrix elements times a Fermi function times a, a spectral function for the fermions. This thing is some matrix elements times a Bose factor times a spectral function for the bosons. So it's sort of like ARPES for the bosonic degrees of freedom, if you like. Um, anyway, it can measure collective modes with it, which was sort of the whole idea. And electrons have a lot of mass, so you can measure things at finite Q non-zero momentum that you can't really do readily with photons. So it's a great way to detect demons. Of course, when we built the instrument, I'd never heard of a demon, but nevertheless, it turns out to be good for that. Um, okay, so let's suppose you just were to guess what you would expect to see in strontium ruthenate. Um, strontium ruthenate's a metal. You probably would expect to see a plasmon. So where do plasmons appear? Well, plasmons show up normally where the real part of the dielectric function crosses zero. So the dielectric function of strontium ruthenate has been measured. It's in this paper. And the real part crosses zero at, oh, one and a half EV, something like that. So you might expect to see a peak at about one and a half EV. So then, so here's what the EELS data look like. Uh, this is a picture of Ali when he was a student. And um, here's some rather unexciting looking EELS data. So this is energy transfer on the horizontal axis. This is high energy scales, this is EVs. And on the vertical is the scattered intensity. And these different curves correspond to different momentum transfers starting from around the gamma point marching out toward the Brouhan zone boundary. So Q in this talk are gonna be specified in what are called reciprocal lattice units. So what that means is um, if I take this, so uh, if I take one over the value of Q, that corresponds to the wavelength of the excitation in lattice parameters. So Q of 0.12 is, um, is uh, eight lattice parameter period. 
Q of 0.5 is two lattice parameter period. So these are sort of neutron scattering units. At any rate, this is low momentum. And as you march out, um, you can see what happens. At any rate, the smallest Q, what you see is a peak. And it's not exactly one and a half EV. It's maybe a little bit lower. And it's really broad. Um, nevertheless, that's the plasma. Okay, so strontium ruthenate has a plasmon. It's roughly at the energy you expect. It's extremely broad. I mean, the way I always say it, it's, it's not a plasmon that you'd bring home to meet the parents, uh, but it's there. So um, good, nice check. So let's now look at low energy and see uh, what we see. Uh, Peter, Peter uh, uh, what is the mechanisms of the broadening? Is it just... Uh... Landau damping? Um, it is, if you calculate the Landau damping, it's too small by about two orders of magnitude. So there is a bunch of higher order decay processes that are damping this plasmon. And this is turns out to be something we've seen now in a lot of materials. Uh, uh, Landau damping is a concept from the random phase approximation from RPA. And you may be, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, if you calculate the lifetime of a plasmon in RPA at Q equals zero, it's always infinite. Plasmon has a, is a delta function in RPA. And the reason is because RPA just allows for the possibility that a, that a collective mode can decay into individual electron hole pairs. But in the real world, there are two, there are four body, six body, eight body decay processes that are important that actually determine the lifetime of a plasmon. If you measure it in infrared, you know, there's a scattering rate and to calculate a scattering rate requires really complicated many body physics, very hard to compute. If, if experiments were done at helium temperatures, would you expect that it would be much more narrow? I don't think so. I think this is intrinsic. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's really many body physics. In other words, RPA is not really quantitative. It's good at sort of telling you how many excitations are present, roughly their energy scale, but it won't tell you lifetimes. Oh, I see. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Okay, good. Great questions. Um, all right, so let's look at low energy now. So this is now um, 100 milliEV full scale. And um, these now are also correspondingly much, much smaller momenta. So this is um, 0.1 in uh, reciprocal lattice units full scale. So 0.02 is 1 over 50 lattice parameters. 0.05 is 1 over 20 lattice parameters. This is 1 over 10 lattice parameters. So it's quite low momentum. So um, these are two different temperatures. So blue is, is 30 Kelvin, red is 300 Kelvin. And you can see one thing that's kind of clear there's a phonon here at about 60 milliEV. Uh, that phonon's dipole loud. You can see it in infrared optics. Um, it's a, I think it's a, let's say, a, a, let me not speculate. I think it's a B1U mode, if I recall. Anyway, it's a well, it's a known phonon. And so that's nice that we, sh we should be able to see that. And we do. If you look at low energy, though, there's another peak there. So if I just focus on the red, at zero, it's not there, but as you increase momentum, you can see a peak comes out of the elastic line at zero. And as you increase momentum, it shifts up in energy and broadens, eventually collides with this phonon and then damps away. So that was the mode that we saw in 2018 and didn't know what it was. It's reasonably sharp, 20 MeV or so, depends on Q. It's very dispersive, it's very fast excitation. And it's, it's within the precision of the measurement, seems to be gapless. So my student, Ali, came in and said, what is this thing? And I said, well, it's an acoustic phonon. It's a gapless mode. It's clearly a, it's clearly a acoustic, probably a TA mode on the surface of a sample or something like that. Um, yeah, so that's an actual known mode. Uh, it looks a little more compelling on a color plot. So it's just the same data. Um, this is momentum on this axis, energy on this axis. So here's that conventional phone on. And now we've added points on the plot that came from some fits with error bars. And that's the dispersion of the mode. So it's not perfectly linear. It's got kind of a Q squared foot at small Q. But, and there it is. So the question is, what is this thing? 
So at first, I assumed it was an acoustic phonon, but if you look closely, it's not an acoustic phonon. And the reason is it's about a factor of 100 too fast. So acoustic phonons travel at the sound velocity. The sound velocity in strontium ruthenate in suitable units is about um, 10 to the minus 2 EV angstrom. The velocity of this mode is about 0.64, so it's about a factor of 100 faster than the sound velocity. This velocity is actually of order the Fermi velocity, so it's way too fast. It's really something electronic. It's significantly smaller, slower than a photon, by the way. H bar C is 2,000 eV angstrom, so it isn't some polariton mode or something like that. It's sort of something that's got the same speed as the Fermi velocity. Uh, um, the other thing if, I Peter, yeah. if you yeah. transform it to the meters per second, Yes. How much would it be? It's about um, it's about a half a million meters per second. So it's about half the Fermi velocity of graphene. Oh, very fast. It's really fast. Yes. Uh, yeah. just, just may I add to, to, to the question. Uh, do I understand correctly that because of this big 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 speed, one cannot absorb this in new at least with thermal neutrons. Um, I think you could, oh, thermal, probably not thermal. I think you could see it with a spallation source. Yeah, spallation, yeah, okay. Uh, the, the, but I don't think you'll couple with it. Neutrons don't see neutral excitations. No, but neutral. neutrons are coupled to, to normal phonons, and phonons have to have to mix with these excitations. Therefore, yeah, that's right. having sufficient that's right. sensitivity, you can see. Of course, it might be very weak. Yeah, it's a. I think that's a yes. Good. So um, theoretically, you're correct. In practice, probably you wouldn't see it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's probably too weak. Mm -hmm. uh, but kinematically, it should be possible. Okay. So then we thought, well, maybe it's a surface plasmon. You know, surface plasmons are gapless. They follow this kind of polariton curve. Um, but that doesn't work either because the polar the gapless region it's a polariton the velocity here is the same as the light cone so um it should have a velocity of order of this in fact you can't even see polaritons with eels because the mass of the electron is too high um so actually eels normally just see this frequency here which is called the ritchie frequency which in strontium ruthenate is 1.4 ev so it wouldn't even be gapless in that measurement so then we thought, could it be maybe a collective mode from a surface state? A lot of materials that cleave them, there's a surface state there. And then you can get a gapless collective mode because there's a two deg on the surface. And all plasmons in two dimensions are gapless. Things like that have been seen in beryllium, copper, other things. And it turns out strontium ruthenate has a surface state. If you cleave it at cryogenic temperatures, there's a broken bond that's sticking up and you get a partially filled band there. But it turns out it gets instantly passivated by any amount of carbon monoxide in the chamber. And our system had quite a lot of carbon monoxide. And there's several papers on this. Um, so basically, that thing would be passivated. We wouldn't be able to see it. So then we started asking, could it be this demon thing? I knew about this from my PhD advisor, Phil Platzman, who worked on these things many years ago. And so we started looking into that. So um, honestly, the only way to tell is to just do a calculation. And the only calculation we really know how to do is RPA, as Dimitri just mentioned. So that's where Edwin Huang came in. So he's a theorist in our Institute for Condensed Matter Theory. And I won't get into a long diatribe of, on RPA. My experimentalist explanation is what you fundamentally compute in RPA is the Lindhard function. So this is the particle hole bubble. And in strontium ruthenate, we can do this more or less exactly, at least at small momentum, because the band structure is known. So the bands have been studied a lot with ARPEZ. Um, there's a tight binding parameterization from Sergei Borisenko's group in Dresden that has really mapped this out nicely. So we just took the known band structure, plugged it into the Lindhard function, and plugged that into the RPA formula. So there's no adjustable parameters uh, the only number that you have to put in is epsilon infinity, which is four and a half. Even that's known. So there's nothing to fit. You just plug it in and then see what you get. We thought, okay, let's see if you get, well, first of all, a normal plasmon, and then let's see if you get a demon. So this is the first result. And I have 50 minutes or an hour. I already had some questions. I'm almost, I'm actually pretty close to done. I maybe need five more minutes. Um, 
Okay. Anyway, so what what you met what you calculate an RPA is chi double prime of Q and omega, and this is momentum on the horizontal axis, frequency on the vertical axis. The color is the magnitude of chi, and what's and chi as I mentioned earlier goes to zero like Q squared. So what's plotted here is chi divided by Q squared. So if this thing ha goes to a constant color at small Q, then that means that the thing's going to zero like Q squared, which it should according to F sum rule. So um, if you look at the high energy region, then you expect to see a plasmon, and there it is. And it's at around one and a half EV, which is similar to what we see in the experiment. The width is really narrow, much narrower than the experiment, but we already know RPA doesn't give lifetimes and things. So, But it tells you the right number of modes, and it tells you the rough energy. So there it is. Everything's good. And then we thought, okay, let's look down at low energy now and see if there's a demon. And then that's what this is. So this is the same data, just now on a much lower energy and momentum scale. And if you look in there, what you see is nothing. And we thought, oh, well, I guess there's not a demon. There must be something really wrong. But if you look closely and just zoom in on the intensity, actually, there's a mode there. It's hard to see. So if you take chi double prime, multiply by one over Q squared, you see a mode, but its intensity is going to zero. It looks like its frequency is going to zero as Q goes to zero, but its intensity is as well. And then once we realized, of course it doesn't because it's a, of course it goes to zero because it's a demon. A demon is neutral. Its intensity can't go to zero like Q squared. That's what a regular plasmon does. If this is a collective mode of neutral particles, it's got to go to Q, got to go to zero faster. So if you take this thing and divide by Q to the fourth, there's a mode there. And um, if you dig into the data and do some matrix decompositions of the susceptibility, you can show this comes about from an out-of-phase modulation of the beta and gamma bands. And both of these are electron-like bands. Neither one of them is a whole band. But they still form a demon. And the reason is because they beat, beat out of phase by, um, by pi. So um, here's an interesting thing. So strontium ruthenate is theoretically expected to have a demon. And we did an experiment and we saw a gapless collective mode. So wouldn't it be interesting to compare them with the theoretical curve on the experimental curve and see if they match? And that is this. So this is momentum on this scale, energy on this scale. The color points are the experiment. The gray line is the RPA. And the velocities are within 10%. So at this point, I usually stop and I ask the audience, do these curves agree or do they disagree? <laughs> what do you think? I reasonably agree. Ooh, spoken like a real physicist. They agree reasonably. Yeah, not exact. Some people say, well, they clearly disagree. I would say um, it's okay. For condensed metaphysics, it's okay. Yeah. Until we ask somebody, somebody from the cold atoms community. Yeah. So maybe it's just the low standards of our discipline that we would consider this agreement. Um, there's one way in which the agreement is excellent, and that's that there is a mode. I mean, it could have happened that there was no gapless mode at all. Not everything has a demon. So the fact that you even see an excitation at all is some indication. And also, RPA is not exact, right? It's missing all kinds of, of effects, excitonic effects, local field factors, higher bar body decay processes, all kinds of stuff is missing. It would be weird if they agreed perfectly. Uh, so, could, um, could I, could yeah. I interrupt you? What's that? Could I interrupt you for a question? Please. Uh, this picture suggests that optical phonon and the demon don't hybridize it's true is it what what is expected it is is it I, what expected i i'm an experimentalist so i i try not to have too many expectations um let me just say they don't mix they cruise right through each other i would think they would mix i don't know two longitudinal charge modes ought to optical is, tra is transverse it's uh, it's an odd parity mode, the optical one. 
Yeah, uh, uh, it might. It's simple. It's yeah. It could just be a transverse. Yeah, actually, it's probably a transverse mode. Um, am I right? am I correct that because you have at least three di three different atoms in a unit cell, you would expect that number of optical mode is larger, not just one. Yeah, there's a bunch of them. Yeah, yeah, there are a bunch of them. So only one of them is visible in this experimental setup. Yeah, well, if you scan to higher energy, there's more. I just oh, I see. Yeah. Um, but if you add up the number of clear modes we see, it doesn't come out to three times the number of atoms minus three. If you extend this plot to higher momento energies and where the other phonon modes are, do, do they hybridize or not? Um, with each other? Uh, with, with demon. Well, the demon actually damps out above this and you don't okay, see it at all. Oh, I see. So point okay. 0.08 is the critical momentum of the demon. Beyond that, it's completely damped, which actually is quite like a plasmon. If you look at the width of this thing, it goes like Q squared, which is sort of what you expect for Landau damping in a Fermi liquid. Oh, I see so it doesn't live to a large Q. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, okay, so I'm just about out of time. So let me just return briefly to the question of neutrality. Um, so uh, we needed to close the loop and ask, is this thing actually neutral? So to assess whether it's neutral, it's necessary to compare it to the F sum rule. So a normal charge mode should go like Q squared meaning the intense integrated intensity should go like Q squared. That's mandated by the F sum rule. Um, so we wanted to do an analysis like that for this measurement. We, but the, the thing that made this complicated is the fact that this is a surface measurement and you measure a surface susceptibility. It's not the same as the one that you compute in RPA. So you have to compare to the sum rule for the susceptibility that you're measuring. And if you go into the literature, it turns out no one has ever derived a sum rule for the surface eel susceptibility. It's never been done. So I would like to credit Bruno Uchoa from Oklahoma State for actually working this out for us. So he went through all the commutators and computed the um, F sum rule for the surface eels response. So it's in the appendix of this paper. And the bottom line is, and if you write it in terms of the scattering cross section, which is the most useful thing for analyzing the data, then it actually can be written as an integral over the surface density. And um, so if you imagine your demon is some intensity times a thing that's dispersing like Q squared, which is what it actually does in the measurement, you come to the conclusion that the integrated intensity go, should go like one over Q to the fifth if it satisfies the F sum rule. The reason it has this funny form is because we put all the matrix elements and everything in because that's in the experiment. So this is what you'd compare directly to the raw data. So if the thing is neutral, it should go like Q to some power where that power is greater than minus five, minus five being what you'd get if it's just say a 2D plasmon from a 2D layer or something like that. <clears throat> so this is sort of the last thing in the paper if you so this is transferred momentum Q on a log scale. This is integrated intensity on a log scale. So it's a log log plot. So power laws show up as lines. Uh, one over Q to the fifth is the dashed line. And what the data do is something significantly smaller power than that, um, meaning less negative. So it's actually close to Q to the minus 1.8. And minus 1.8 is significantly greater than minus five. So it's consistent with the mode being neutral. Um, so it's gapless. For a charge mode to be gapless, it has to be neutral. And it turns out, if you check it, it's consistent with the sum rule. If you check it against the sum rule, it's also consistent with it being neutral. So the weirdest thing happened when the paper came out. This thing broke the internet. I've never seen this before. So if you go to Google or YouTube and type demon particle, there's just a ridiculous number of, of, of public interest articles about this. Um, I actually did interviews with several magazines. My favorite article is the one in the Daily Mail. You know, the Daily Mail is the magazine where they tried to, this is like a right-wing magazine in the, United, in the United Kingdom that advocated for Brexit. 
And it's, I think something about, um, it's a gapless collective mode that's neutral, that is dipole forbidden. You can't see it with light. All the media picked up in a, a, a massless invisible demon particle discovered which I never would have occurred to me to say that. But anyway, um, I would just like to say that I take no credit for any of this. I'm not smart enough to make this kind of thing happen on purpose. And I don't consider making an impact on the internet to be a sign of good science. But it's nice that people noticed what we did because it was a lot of work. Uh, chest question in the chat. Look at this. Maybe a commentary on how we can gather interest in condensed matter physics. Yeah, I think come up with cool names for stuff. The demon particle. Uh, okay, so just to summarize, um, strontium ruthenate has a gapless mode, and it's a demon. It was predicted 67 years ago by David Pines, and we only saw it in 2018, and by accident. And... This is a fundamental collective mode of matter. You know, there's certain excitations that you just consider to be the standard modes of matter. Magnons, phonons, plasmons, excitons. There's another one, and it's a demon. And demons should not be rare. There are lots and lots of metals that have more than one Fermi surface. Not all of them are guaranteed to have a demon, but any of them can. And demons can do things. They can mediate superconductivity. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but strontium ruthenate is a very unusual superconductor. So interesting question whether this demon might have something to do with the reason. Um, you can think of a demon as sort of being an out-of-phase oscillation of two sets of electrons. One way to think about it is it's a modulation in the band index. So you know a, a phonon is a modulation in the lattice parameter, a magnon is a modulation in the spin index. <clears throat> a demon is a modulation in the band filling. So um, what it is in strontium ruthenate is an oscillation of the beta band where the gamma band is 180 degrees out of phase. And that's done in such a way that the overall charge density is constant because you don't change the total number of electrons at any given point. You just oscillate them between two different bands. So that's what makes it neutral. So it's sort of like a magnon where what's modulated is this is the band index of the material. And like I said before, um, demons are not rare and they can do things. So um, we should invest, should be asking whether more materials have demons and if they could be driving superconductivity and doing other things. Okay, another chat. I think I might have missed it, but do we know why the low energy behavior of the demon mode is quadratic? Ooh, good question. I think I know, but I didn't tell you. <laughs> um. Let me stop here and ask for questions. And maybe I should just take that as the first one. Yeah, perfect. Okay, uh, good. Why is it quadratic? Okay, in RPA, it should be something linear-ish. In reality, it's quadratic. Why? Okay, I'll tell you my experimentalist explanation for this. If you fit the actual response function as a function of Q down here, it fits very well to the form for relaxational dynamics of a scalar order parameter. What is relaxational dynamics? That's like diffusion, okay? So I can take the formula out of Chaikin and Lubensky's book for diffusion and fit the data perfectly in that limit. So what does this really mean? In my opinion, what it means is that for long wavelengths over long distances, the demon ceases to propagate ballistically and it starts to propagate um, diffusively. So if you ask, so another way to phrase the question is what does it really mean for this dispersion curve to go to zero with finite slope all the way to Q equals zero? It means no matter how small a Q I look at, this thing's undergoing ballistic transport because it has an infinite lifetime. That's fine in RPA, but in reality, it never happens. Every excitation, it's sufficiently long distances, it eventually propagates diffusively. So somehow, as a consequence of the finite quasi-particle lifetimes, eventually this thing crosses over to something like Q squared. And I think it has to do with the fact that, you know, quasi-particles at the Fermi energy, the fermions, don't have an infinite lifetime. So the collective mode can't either. So eventually it just, be, it just propagates like uh, heat. 
But that's an experimental statement. I don't have a theory. But good question. Anything uh, else? Okay. Uh, Matt, please go forward. Uh, oh, can a demon have a magnetic response? Uh, can, yeah. Can, yes. I can't speak on Zoom. Oh. If you believe David Pines, it has no magnetic signature. Strontium ruthenate is a little different because it has very strong spin orbit coupling. And um, so L and S are strongly coupled. I there, No one has done a theory of demons for strongly spin orbit coupled bands. It wouldn't surprise me if they ended up having some magnetic character, but I haven't, nobody's worked that out yet. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Uh... Actually, I have one. So, Peter, you have mentioned that you have encountered the demon unintentionally. Yeah. But if you go to search for a demon, what would be a perfect material or perfect condition where you would expect them to be, I don't know, the strongest or the most easy observable or... Yeah, I, I think I don't know. I mean, um, you need two different bands at least. <laughs> And they need to be sufficiently different from one another that you can get some pull, some resonance. Um, I don't know. I've always been really bad at predicting what experiments are going to work and which ones aren't. Right now, we're studying bismuth. Bismuth is a nice semi-metal. It has a hole-like pocket at the gamma point and some electron-like pockets at the zone boundary. And they have pretty long quasi-particle lifetimes. Right now, we're seeing if that has a demon. I would probably look at anything with more than one Fermi surface. Iron arsenide materials, uh, MgB2. What the conventional semi-metal with these electrons and holes that are un uncompensated, would it, would it be a good candidate? In one band? Uh, in, in, in two bands. Band conduction and valence band when they overlap. Nictites, iron nictites. Nictites, yeah, I think so, yeah. Uh, Nictites are such a thing, right? Or there's a whole pocket at the gamma point, or at the, uh, yeah, at the gamma point. It comes above the Fermi energy, and then around the zone corner, there's an electron pocket. That's a good candidate. Um, may, I, may, may I ask my question? If, please, Alec, please, Alec, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is... Mm, uh, the, just purely theoretical, uh, purely theoretical at this stage. Uh, uh, you discuss 3D material. If we consider 2D material, plasmon is scales as square root of Q, right? Yeah. And you understand correctly that still you expect that your demon is linear. In RPA. Oh, in 2D or in 3D? 2D, 2D, 2D. No, no, no. I, I want to project it 2D. You know that plasmon is diff significantly different, right? Yeah, um, I think it's still linear. Yeah, because the velocity comes from the velocity. There's no Coulomb energy. So it the, the all the energy comes from the dispersion of the band. So it it uh, should, yeah, it should be linear, I would think. Okay, you say it's Gallstone. It's another Gallstone. But if it's Gallstone, it should not be influenced by diffusion. It's oh. still linear. It's well, like I didn't theory. say it was a Goldstone mode. <laughs> Because if you have a disordered material, sound is still okay, right? You have a sound in a absolutely disordered material. Amorphous. Yeah, so it, may, it may be, I mean, as we all know, you can make, if I take a very disordered material, it can I can make good sound insulation out of it. Because there's a sound mode that's there in principle, but it's scattered elastically very strongly. The reason being that K is not a good quantum number. Right, because I don't have translational symmetry. It's sufficiently low. So, okay, it's okay. No, the mode is there in principle, but in practice, it's broadened. Okay. And you know, you're, this is a measurement at finite momentum, right? We don't really look at Q equals zero exactly. So mm -hmm. I think disorder probably has some effect. Okay. Okay. Uh, could, could I ask a naive question? If you kick the surface by a small hammer, 
does it mean that it, you will have just so sound propagating, but with the velocity that is enormous and compared to the usual sound in your yeah. materials? That's exactly what it means. Is it possible, do you think, to measure it in this way by just by the delay? Um, well, it moves a lot faster than sound, so you wouldn't be able to use normal transducers. You'd have to find some electronic way of measuring sound, which is kind of what we did, right? We used electrons. But you're saying, could I put a speaker at one point and then a transducer at another? Exactly. Could be possible, but they better be really fast. I mean, fast like femtoseconds. Or you, you need know. a big, or you need a large sample. I don't know. Yeah, and well, but don't forget, this thing doesn't propagate forever. Its mean right. free path is a few hundred lattice parameters. So you know, I think what you're imagining probably ends up being some near field pump probe experiment you know some nano optics thing where i have two focus a few hundred nanometers apart and i pump with one and probe with the other and look for some correlations which looks like a near field you'd have to do something like that uh any other questions uh, yes i have a small question uh, thank you for your talk <laughs> so I, I i was wondering if uh, so if i understood well uh, the Fermi surfaces are anisotropic in your system. Yeah. And so yeah. I was wondering if this could lead to an anisotropic speed of these demons or, or not. Yeah, and it is anisotropic. Um, I don't okay. have a, do I have a, yes, it knows about the lattice. Do I have a picture of that? I didn't, I didn't put it in this one, but um, yeah, the velocity is angle dependent around the Fermi surface. Okay, and so then for, for the for the picture you showed, like this one, is it integrated over uh, over the angle, or uh, is it on a particular no. on a particular it's, direction? It's in the pi zero direction. This is okay. pi zero. Yeah, but if I go along pi pi, the velocity is different by about 20, fifteen percent. Oh wow! Okay, okay. It's quite different. And by the way, the, the velocity is also temperature dependent. I didn't mention this in the talk. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. it's somehow dressed by some excitations in the system that change with temperature. So that's also intriguing. OK. Thank you. Any other questions, please just go ahead. Wait a couple of seconds. <clears throat> if not, let, let's thank you. Let's thank Peter for the fantastic talk. <laughs>